All right, uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Dr. Maynard. I am a pediatrician with uh, Mission, Mission Heritage Medical Group in Mission Viejo, uh, formerly with Kaiser, and uh, I uh, went to medical school at New York Medical College. And joining me is Dr. Hong. She can tell you about herself. Hi, my name is Dr. Lisa Hong, also with Mission Heritage. Uh, previously, I was with uh, um, St. Joseph Heritage up in Tustin. I did my residency and training here in uh, Orange at, with Chalk. I went to medical school in San Diego, UCSD. And um, we're happy today to present to you about the COVID vaccines, uh, specifically the five to 11 year old um, newly approved COVID vaccine. So we'll start just by talking about what topics will be covered in this. Of course, sort of uh, we'll be able to answer any general questions about uh, the COVID vaccine for children. Uh, is it safe? Is it effective? Uh, has it been well studied? We'll go a little over that. And uh, do children really get COVID? Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about the new variant that's been in the news a lot, the Omicron variant of COVID. And then finally, we'll, we'll talk about some strategies uh, to keep your family safe during the holidays. Uh, briefly, uh, financial disclosures, we have none. No financial disclosures or other disclosures to make. And so I'll just start off uh, talking about what the vaccine is. So the only vaccine available for children right now is the Pfizer Biotech uh, vaccine, which is a messenger RNA vaccine. I'll explain a little more of that in a second. Uh, and it's given in two shots. The first one uh, is intramuscular in the shoulder, just like the adult ones. It's given uh, and is given. And then the second one is also intramuscular, given three weeks later. Uh, a difference between this vaccine and the one that teenagers and adults get is that it's only one third the dose. So it is less. Uh, than what, uh, what other people will get. And something to remember is that full protection from the vaccine occurs five weeks after that first dose. And so unfortunately, we're getting pretty close to Christmas now, so it's a little late to get full protection by Christmas. But even if, if a child was vaccinated today, they would get some protection. So it's still worth doing uh, regardless. Uh, so very briefly, how does, a, how does an mRNA vaccine work? What is it? Uh, so this, this uh, picture I chose because I thought it showed a, it was a good example. Let me get my pointer on here. So it starts as the vaccine, which is injected into the muscle. That vaccine has mRNA in it. And mRNA have to be protected by a little bubble in order to get into cells. Now, the mRNA then goes and gets turned into proteins which are similar to the virus spike protein, just a little piece of the virus. And that gets shown on the surface of the cell. And then antibodies and immune cells are created, which protect uh, the person who got the vaccine. An important thing to understand is that the mRNA is degraded after quickly after the, uh, the spike protein is made, meaning it doesn't go into your DNA and that's protected in the nucleus here. Uh, it just gets broken down. So just to, to reiterate that, it's like the old Inspector Gadget uh, messages, if you guys, I don't, might be dating myself, but he would read these messages and then they explode. That's, that's all that message is. It just goes away uh, and cannot affect the cells after that. Um, the benefits of the vaccine are pretty clear. 90.7 uh, is one figure I see, 90.7% effective in children, some, some studies even say higher than that, uh, meaning that 90.7% of the children that would have gotten sick didn't get infected at all. Uh, another important fact is that even if you do get infected, which we all know that sometimes people who get the vaccine do get infected, uh, but even if these children did get infected, the chances of them being hospitalized from the infection were much less, eight times less than children that weren't vaccinated. Uh, so there were eight children uh, who were unvaccinated and who caught COVID and were unvaccinated for every one child that uh, was vaccinated. And then once you're protected, 
you could the positives are well you can probably participate in sports more easily you uh, school programs other programs for children or even perhaps travel uh, depending on on how high the COVID rates are at the time there's also protection against miss c or uh, multi system inflammatory syndrome in children uh, which got a lot of press early on in the in the pandemic and you, could, you also have to remember that you're not just protecting yourself by getting the vaccine, you're protecting other people around you, the elderly, the young, the people whose immune systems aren't as strong or the very young who can't get the vaccine at all. So it's important to remember that as one of the benefits. Uh, once again, it, the effectiveness in clinical trials is, is listed here. Is it effective? Yeah, it's an effective vaccine. It keeps people out of the hospital. It keeps most, most people from getting sick. And that's true for adults and children. Of course, with any vaccine, there's adverse effects. You can get pain at the injection site. That's the most common. Fatigue, maybe in about 30% of children and, uh, and adults who get the vaccine. And then headaches, muscle pain, chills, fever, and nausea. Those are actually less and less common. If those, those uh, side effects do occur, they tend to only last one to two days. So they're uh, very brief and well worth it for the protection you get. Uh, another thing I just wanted to talk about briefly, you may have heard about vaccine-associated myocarditis. Myocarditis is inflammation in the heart, and uh, COVID disease actually itself causes severe, can cause severe myocarditis. The vaccine has been shown to cause myocarditis in some, uh, some children in the 12 to 17-year-old range, and young adults. It tends to be more males, and it, uh, it tends to uh, self-resolve rapidly, meaning if you have symptoms, it's very treatable, lasts a few days, and then goes away. Um, so far, uh, it's inconclusive whether this is even going to occur in children 5 to 11 years old. There were no uh, cases of myocarditis in that age group during the clinical trials. And then allergic reaction, very rare. We don't see a lot of allergic reactions to the vaccine, uh, especially not a serious one. It is possible for children to have an allergic reaction in their skin at the site of injection, but that actually doesn't prevent you from getting the second dose. It's not, not a severe reaction, uh, but really it's not something to worry about too much. And then uh, I'm gonna pass off to Dr. Hong, who's gonna talk a little more about has the vaccine been studied? So a very common question that we do get is, it uh, got developed so fast, was it well studied? Was it, uh, did they cut any corners? So um, this picture here you can see gives you an idea of uh, what a top part tells you what a traditional vaccine development um, timeline is like. Usually it takes about five to 15 years. And it goes to phase one, phase two, phase three, and then it goes through approval process before it's manufactured and then given into arms or, or thighs. And so you can see um, each of these phases are there to make sure that it is both effective and safe to be given to the public. What happened with the COVID vaccine was that each of these steps were done. It's just because of all the um, effort and time and money and personnel um, and the priority it got, all the phases were done simultaneously or overlapping. So before phase one was done, they were able to start phase two because they were able to get funding for it and personnel for it in phase three. And manufacturing started uh, uh, by the time they were at phase three. And so all the steps were taken, it, they, they just overlapped. So that allowed it to be um, developed quicker than what we are normally used to. No corners were cut and all the studies were done as per their normal protocols. Um, the other reason why it got developed so quickly was because there was an international effort as well. This is a global pandemic. So we had technology and we had um, uh, studies and um, help from a lot of other scientists in the world, including um, studies and um, uh, cases from you know, other places like Israel. Um, the other reason why I was able to even get to this point where it was uh, so quickly developed is because this technology, the mRNA vaccine has been around. This actually has been around since the 60s and clinical trials using mRNA 
um, has been done since you know, uh, 2001. So it's been around, this technology has been around. So they were able to apply a technology that they had. They were able to uh, go through each of the phase simultaneously so that they overlapped. And with the aid and funding from, um, from the, uh, multiple sources, um, that's what made it possible for the vaccine to be available. Um, this vaccine for the five to 11 year olds specifically, there were about 3000 participants who got the vaccine. And so it was a, um, a good robust study. Um, there were more people who uh, volunteered to be a part of the trial because there were so many kids and so many adults who wanted uh, to be a part of this. So that allowed the, the vaccines also to move forward with their testing. The other reason why it was really helpful was because there's a high rate of disease in the community. So if we were developing a vaccine for a very rare disease, it would be it would take a long time. But because there was so much uh, disease in the community, uh, this part was not as difficult for the scientists. To date, there have been about five million kids aged five to eleven who've gotten the COVID vaccine or who've gotten their first shot. About two point seven million have gotten both. So you can rest assured that. A lot of kids have gotten this vaccine already and let's just sure that it was well studied. No corners were cut and uh, all the steps were taken. Next slide, please. Um, this is another slide just so that you can kind of understand the uh, regulatory process. So it had to go through clinical trials and uh, the application had to be submitted. It had to go through multiple phases of approval before it can uh, get to the public. So you can see it's not a uh, not a quick and easy thing to do. Next slide, please. The other question that I commonly get is, well, okay, do the children really get sick from COVID? Do we really need this vaccine? Well, yes, children can get sick from it. It's true that they aren't as affected as the adults, but they still can get sick. So for the pediatric cases, there have been about 6.3 million pediatric cases. Within the five to 11 year old age range, there's about 1.9 million cases of COVID. Um, of that, there have been 24,000 pediatric hospitalizations. Within this five to 11 age range, there have been about 8,300 hospitalizations. The scary part about this is that of the 8,300 that have been hospitalized that are five to 11, about 30% of them have no risk factors. Um, here locally at Chalk at the hospital, um, there have been about 700 hospitalizations um, for, for uh, COVID. Um, the other thing that, the other, uh, the other disease Dr. Maynard mentioned briefly, the multi-inflammatory syndrome or MISC, um, there have been about um, 2,300 children in this age range who've gotten it. Uh, about 100 locally at Chalk since the beginning of the pandemic. And the median age of the kids who get this are around nine years old. 39% of them are six to 11 years old. So yes, the children can get pretty sick from COVID uh, and, and can get COVID. The other thing that we're trying to prevent as well is something called long COVID. And you may have heard of this before. These are some of the symptoms that they can get after um, af after recovering from COVID. So this would include things like fatigue, brain fog, body aches um, and pains. So all of these things can still occur. Oh, and also um, loss of continued loss of smell up to 12 weeks after the infection. And about seven to 8% of children uh, have some of these long COVID, long haul COVID um, uh, symptoms. And then finally, some children do die from COVID, not, a, not as many as adults. So to date, there have been about 94 in the US, all of the US, 94 pediatric deaths in this age range. It is still pretty rare, but it um, is not insignificant. Next slide, please. Uh, I get a lot of questions about Omicron and uh, the truth is there's still a lot that is unknown, not too much that I can tell you, but here's what I can tell you. Um, it is here in the states, about 35 states have reported it, California has reported it. And so um, with, with all the traveling, all the holidays, it's here, okay? Um, the other thing I can tell you is that the vaccines and the boosters seem to have some effect. So we don't know how much protection you can get from the vaccine or the booster, but it is not zero. Uh, there, the other thing I know, the other thing I can tell you about Omicron is that it does seem to be more contagious. 
Um, we use this number called R0 to give you an idea of how contagious it can be. And uh, the most dominant strain right now, the most dominant variant is a variant called De Delta variant, and that has an R0 of two. Anything greater than an R0 of one means it can very likely spread. And Omicron so far, the latest data I've seen shows that R0 of three. So it is more contagious. Um, but more studies need to be done, and there's not that much clear, concrete things I can tell you about Omicron just yet. Next slide, please. So here is the biggest question. How can I keep my family safe this holiday season? Well, here's a few tips. Number one, get your vaccines. Get your vaccines. If you were not vaccinated, please, please vac get vaccinated for COVID, against COVID. Uh, if you are eligible for your booster, please, please, please get your booster because more and more studies are showing that the boosters do play a role in protecting us and our family against uh, Omicron. Vaccinate your kids if they are eligible. So all of the, every child over five should get vaccinated. And it's not just uh, not just with COVID, for COVID, against COVID, but also against flu as well. Uh, we are actually going to have true flu season this year because more kids are out and about. So please get your kids vaccinated, both against flu and against COVID. And um, flu vaccines are available to children over six months of age. So uh, talk to your doctors, they uh, talk to your pediatrician. Um, COVID vaccines are available at most drugstores and all. Like, there's a, a lot of places you can get it. Reach out to us if you need help finding the COVID vaccine or the flu vaccine. Um, number three, wear a mask when you're indoors, especially if you're indoors with crowds or if you're indoors with um, uh, uh, at gatherings. So wear a mask. The kids are all very used to wearing masks nowadays. So, you know, get a good mask. Um, uh, another common question I get is, well, which one is the better mask? Well, the best mask for your kids is a mask that fits well and a mask that they'll keep on. So you can buy very expensive masks that say they have great protection, but if your kid's not going to wear it or if it doesn't fit properly or it hurts their nose, they're not going to wear it. It's not as useful. So find one that your kid will wear and that has a good fit. Um, and then one thing I didn't add on here uh, that you can consider is uh, um, uh, testing. So there are a lot of uh, over-the-counter tests that you can consider uh, getting if, uh, if, if that is one additional step you want to do to keep your family safe. Next slide, please. Um, again, I urge everybody to get their vaccine. You can see here in this picture, um, it gives us it gives our kids an extra layer of protection with the COVID-19 vaccine. Next slide, please. This is my kid getting her vaccine. Um, my, I have three kids. Um, one, one is, uh, the oldest is uh, turning 11 and she was on the first page. This is my, um, this is my eight-year-old and I also have. So it's really important for the two older ones to get their vaccine because they're eligible to protect themselves, but also very important so that they can protect my youngest. And next slide. This is, this is what we also, this is also the other reason why we all need to get the vaccine because we need to protect everybody else. We cannot get the vaccine. People who get the vaccine, but cannot mount a good response, such as our immunocompromised aunties and uncles and grandmas and grandpas. And so it's really important to get the vaccines to protect ourselves to protect our children and to protect everybody else who's vulnerable. Um, next slide, I think that's it. Any questions? Thank you so much, Dr. Hong, Dr. Maynard. This was a great presentation. Um, we do have a participant with us. Did you wanna ask any questions, Jeff? I know you're online. <laughs> no, I'm good. Thank you. <laughs> um, Thank you. While we're here at this slide, I wanted to just uh, mention that Dr. Maynard and I are the pediatricians here at Mission Heritage. We are uh, right next to, right across the parking lot, actually, from the uh, Mission Hospital. And um, we have started here a few months ago. So reach out if you guys have any questions, come and visit us. And uh, we're here if you guys need us.